Uh, so you uh, spent some time writing your book yes. on this uh, software supply yep. chain security. So tell us what motivates you to write this book. Well, uh, so my background is a developer, and for many years leading development projects, and I go between R&D and I IT, and as now a cybersecurity professional, I recognize the gaps and the risks mm -hmm. there is in the software supply chain, and this was before the solar winds attack that most people know. Of course. And I had written a, a chapter for a digital book on software supply chain security before that, and so... You know, it was pretty much always on my mind yep. in regards to uh, the risk that the upstream supply chain can be for software. Uh, when it comes to software and operational technology, are we talking about the firmware yes. on this hardware and also the software that is you know, connecting the physical device to the IT enterprise environment. Yes, both, absolutely. And that's why I couldn't just focus on software in my book with the background that I have. Uh, it says securing the supply chain for software, firmware, and hardware, because it's all works together. Um, so for example, when you think about even just a chipset, so if you're using an Intel chip, there's software and firmware uh, that you use associated to use that chip. So that is part of the supply chain too, not just what we might hear about open source components or even the code written by the supplier. So yes, firmware is just another type of software. Yeah, and let's uh, think about it from a different perspective. OT is very different. Now we have an advantage for those of us that have been building OT products for industrial control systems is that safety was already part of our culture. So bringing cybersecurity into that culture was not difficult at all, you know, 10 plus years ago when uh, the standards like ISA, IEC 62443 came out, and then they had specifically security requirements. But when you're thinking about from a chip manufacturer who doesn't do industrial control systems or just any you know of those environments, what happens is you've got to really consider uh, the opportunity, sort of threat model more than just the software, but what's coming in. And part of that secure by design and then secure by default is uh, you need to be thinking forward ahead. But a lot of us are using um, technologies or we're built, you know, there's products that are multi-generation. So you're adding security features, you know, before. And some of these secure by design principles can be a bit of a challenge because they're written from an IT mindset and not the OT. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't necessarily on a PLC that doesn't have a screen and of course, you know, is a device that could be used in manufacturing or it could be used in an electrical, you know, or power plant or water mm -hmm. distribution plant. It's got different use cases for that one um, one product, one OT product that could be used. And so when you're thinking about how you're going to build the secure by default, sometimes the answers, you know, one environment may want it to do one thing yep. and another environment, do, you know, does something else. So sometimes you have conflicting priorities. And another thing with the IT mindset is uh, like they say MFA. Well, you don't necessarily put multi-factor authentication right. on a PLC, a programmable logic control. Controller, uh, because you know when you need to get access into it, there's other ways to be able to verify that it's an authenticated entity getting into that device. Um, so there's you know now zero trust that you could uh, implement, but you wouldn't necessarily be given an MFA to John, yeah. right? Because he's not got it tied to his cell phone, or you know it may not be set up to the corporate SSO because it's on a separate environment. So there's a lot of considerations that, um, that are being considered for secure by design. And when people say, oh, it's just do this or logging, you don't necessarily have you know, years worth of logs on mm. a single device. You have to have it to be able to be communicating with logging systems. And that's what we see you know, more in the OT world. So yeah, what you're saying is that some of these are principles that we have in DevSecOps, for example, mm -hmm. that is, I guess, uh, developed out of uh, more like an IT mindset, yes. cannot be automatically applied to in the OT software right. supply chain environment. Yes, I okay. mean, some products have a keypad so you can't do, you know, must be a 20 character with a capital A. It could just be a one to nine mm. keypad to be able to get to access control. And you don't want to SMS text somebody because the, you know, you want to be able to get into that system quickly for a safety reason. Action, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm going to ask a question about AI and how that is helping, you yeah. know, or not. 
right? Yeah. In this S bomb and supply chain uh, software development uh, uh, challenges. Yeah. I, well, I think it's uh, just like with everything else, right at the beginning. Uh, some of the advantages that AI will provide to software development and to supply chain is, for example, the ability to analyze large volumes of data. So there are some startups out there that have been scanning and evaluating open source repositories uh, for the last couple of years, and they're able to do analysis mm -hmm. that would have taken a person to be able to see where is the correlation and, and the tie-in between this project and that project. So the with AI technologies, it's able to ingest and analyze large data lakes of information mm -hmm. to be able to say, oh, that maintainer submitted to a malicious project over here, and that same maintainer is now a maintainer on this other project, which doesn't have no malicious, but maybe there's a risk in that, you know, that person that's doing the maintaining. So for example, the person that um, uh, contributed the malicious code to the XZ utils backdoor, if that person had contributed to other projects, mm. we now should suspect every one of those. And you know what would have been take you know potentially taken a person time to go through and track all of the commits, you know within seconds using AI technologies and somebody who had that list and that history, yeah. they're able to d identify that risk altogether. Another way that AI is uh, going to be helping more and more is be able to provide guidance to developers. So up until now, you know, if there's been a vulnerability, let's just take the log for J, you know, how they're going to make that change. Um, the Even though there's coding technologies that can suggest mm -hmm. code, it wasn't smart enough to be able to say in this circumstance, in this example, this is the best code replacement yeah. to do. And I've seen some just amazing startups over the last few months that are able to do that more and more where they're able to say, okay, you know, you're in Python, so this would be the best way. And you're in this, and this would be the best way. So it's actually, and it actually giving lines of code, not like a million, mm -hmm. uh, because you don't want too much changes, um, but it's able to direct them to the exact line that they need to modify and based off of better techniques, not just scanning, yeah. you know, Google or, you know, all the other ones, um, it is doing some intelligence to find uh, verified facts. So I'm seeing AI being used to speed up the efficiency oh, yeah. of development.